Hi there. I don't know about you, but as a horror fan, I started watching these films very young and I couldn't get enough of the taboo genre. I would watch anything from any decade as long as it was scary. Some of the earliest films I can remember seeing were horror classics like the original Nightmare on Elm Street and It, 80s horror comedies like Vamp and The Monster Squad, and occasionally sometimes when I was watching late at night, I'd catch these strange old British horror movies made up of lots of different stories. The ones that enthralled me the most were things like Dr. Terror's House of Horror, Vault of Horror, and in particular, Asylum. Of of course, back then I had no idea that these were all from the same studio, that being Amicus Productions, but I did know I was hooked. Something about short horror spoke to me then, and still does now. I really love the structure of these mini-movies. How as an audience we have to fill in the blanks and decide what we think happens after the credits roll. It's a temporary window into a world of terror. Seeing these films during my formative years has made me a huge fan of portmanteau movies and anthology horrors, but there is one problem with the genre, and that is the inconsistency of quality, be it due to weak story or execution, most shows or films in this genre are a mixed bag. For every superb spooky shot, you get two or three stinkers. For a fan like me with a really high tolerance for schlocky b****, it's no problem at all. I'll happily sit through 90 minutes of awful acting and story if I get at least one good scare out of it but it does put many audiences off and they miss out on some great stories. And that's why I'm making this series of videos. I'll be going through all kinds of different movies and series and bringing you the best individual parts. If this sounds like something you'd enjoy, get subscribed and turn on notifications so you don't miss anything. Now let's dive into the first movie in this series, Nightmare Cinema. This is a 2018 anthology horror movie that features the work of some horror heavy hitters. The movie is a fairly middling anthology with one dull framing device three so-so features and one absolute banger of a short cerebral horror. It's a dark and thought-provoking piece that I want more people to experience. I will be explaining the short in full, so spoiler warning. Make sure to watch to the end, as I'll be talking about the implications of what is actually happening to the main character in this story. As of recording, the film has a 76 tomato meter rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It also comes in at 2.6 out of 5 on Letterboxd and 5.5 out of 10 on IMDb. As we've seen in the past, movies from the horror genre split audiences right down the middle but you can usually trust the professional critics to skew slightly higher when you have big names and high budgets involved. I'm looking at you 94% for Megan. Anyway, back to the point. Nightmare Cinema is a perfectly serviceable horror film with some fun sections that has this jarring and awesome horror gem hidden right in the middle. This Way to Egress, directed by David Slade. As with all the sections in this movie, we start with a bewildered soul wandering in off the street and into an empty cinema. In the story, we follow Helen, played by the brilliant Elizabeth Riesler. Helen looks trepidatious, but is drawn into the seating area by the sound of a ringing mobile. The phone shows the caller is unknown. She calls out into the silence, excuse me, but is answered only by the sound of the cinema a projector starting up. The movie then cuts to black and comes back in with black and white. Excuse me. This artistic choice serves not only as a severe cut, but also to express how Helen feels. She is alone, disconnected and lost. Helen repeats, excuse me, multiple times to a dismissive receptionist who eventually acknowledges her and informs her that the doctor is running late. Helen then takes her seat in the waiting area with her children. She explains to the boys that there's been a delay and they remind her that the receptionist has been giving that same excuse for over an hour now. They mock her and tell her that she's been forgotten about. Helen admonishes her son for talking back, builds herself up and decides to go back to complain. As she approaches the receptionist, she notices the desk, floor and receptionist are covered in dirt. She looks around to see that the whole area is filthy and the magazines on the table are starting to rot. Helen then tries to stand her ground. She suggests that they come back another day. The receptionist rejects this thought and goes on the offensive, informing Helen that they are doing her a favour by squeezing her in to see the doctor. With each passing scene, the receptionist changes. Her face becomes more distorted. Helen backs down and returns to her children as one of them is complaining he needs the toilet. The reading material on their laps is rotten, but both boys seem unaffected by this decay. They're both completely clean and don't seem to notice the filth. The receptionist then informs Helen that the doctor is ready and hurries her along. Helen enters this pristine looking doctor's office and is greeted by Dr. Salazar, played by the excellent Adam Godley. Before Helen takes a seat, the two share this tense moment of silence, in which both parties look apprehensive, the underlying reason for which will become clear later. She sits and they discuss how Helen is feeling. She's afraid because things keep changing around her. This has been happening since her husband left a couple of days ago. However, Helen goes on to insist that his departure has nothing to do with what's happening to her, but it looks as though she can't even persuade herself, let alone the medical professional sitting opposite her. Dr. Salazar digs deeper and asks questions about 
who is and who isn't looking deformed. She explains that her children and the doctor look normal, but everybody else is changing. She talks about how the boys have been maturing recently. It was them who brought her to see this doctor after she found something that morning. Helen instinctively clutches her bag. She's brought this something, this mystery item with her. Helen starts to break down as she talks about how everything is starting to rot. The doctor asks her if she's suicidal, but before she can answer, the intercom interrupts the discussion. Salazar then herds her out of the office, asking her to return the next morning. Helen tries to open up to the doctor, but he just pushes her out. Helen is desperate for somebody to listen and just acknowledge her, shouting after the doctor, just tell me if I'm crazy. She returns to the waiting area to find her children. The boys are now missing and things have decayed even more since she left. Helen talks to various members of staff and asks them about her kids, but curiously, they haven't seen any children at all, let alone hers. With each passing moment, the people there become more warped. Their faces and voices becoming monstrous as Helen unravels. At this point, Helen is visibly getting more upset. It's clear that things are getting worse for her, and she is terrified. Helen continues to search the place and goes to the bathroom, but instead of her kids, she finds this dismissive janitor who gives her no help at all. Helen now is nearing breaking point. She pulls the mystery item from her bag and holds it to the janitor's head. The janitor simply ignores her and the weapon. Helen then goes to a payphone to call Eric, her husband. Initially, she gets his voicemail, but after she starts leaving a message, he answers. Eric immediately becomes aggressive, telling her that they're over. Helen hears a woman in the background of the call and begins to sob. This is presumably Eric's new partner. Helen implores Eric to think about their children. After a pause, a monstrous voice replies, What children? She holds the gun to her head, but can't pull the trigger. Instead, she makes her way back to Dr. Salazar. As she arrives at his office, she hears the doctor talking to her children. They seem to be field agents and are discussing her as if she's a case study. They talk about how best to make her kill herself and whether they should have supplied her with a gun or poison. Seems as though it was decided that a handgun was the best way as they think she needs her actions to be aggressive and they've only given her one bullet because they assume she will use it on herself. They continue to talk about Helen and how she has descended into this reality. It would seem that people can fall through realities and find themselves in places that aren't meant for them. This can be brought about by emotionally shattering life events, such as a breakup of a relationship. As these beings talk about Helen, their voices start to distort. Despite protestations from his partner, one of the field agents posits the idea that maybe they can elevate her back to where she came from. After all, they know she had a family and two boys that she loved. However, the other agent rebukes this and points out that they don't know anything for definite. They can only infer these things based on how she behaves around her children. The doctor postulates that Helen might ascend back to where she came from, but it seems unlikely. Salazar doubts that Helen has the resolve or strength for such an endeavor. The doctor finally reveals to the field agents that he knows Helen is listening to their conversation from the other side of the door. She pushes the door open to find the doctor as a ghoul and the whole world, including her boys, the field agents, covered in detritus. Helen turns the gun on the doctor, then she looks to her children who are now completely clean again. She grabs them and leaves the building. Marching down the steps of the facility, when asked where they're going, she replies, Home. First things first, I absolutely love this short. It's right in my horror sci-fi wheelhouse. We have a story about different levels of reality, a wonderful use of a stark black and white palette, actors playing it with gravitas and kicking in great performances, and effects and makeup that really help us get into Helen's headspace. It all comes together to create an amazingly serious horror shot that I can't stop watching. A particular chilling section for me is when Helen overhears the doctor and the boys discussing her case. I've read some reviews that dismiss this as an exposition dump, and I can understand that reading to a point, but I think it has purpose. For me, the information is presented perfectly. The whole story is told in a cold, sterile way, and so this plot information seems in keeping with the tone. In a longer movie, the world building could be presented in a slower and more subtle manner, and I for one would love to see this film blown up to feature length. But in a short like this, priority is given to exploring the world and the story in a visual way. The conversation regarding levels of reality and the existential horror that's implied, which Helen overhears, is a huge gut punch and serves to make or break this lost soul. In thinking about Helen's plight, I feel the dread that she's experiencing. On one hand, maybe Helen isn't unwell. She's simply fallen through reality, which is petrifying, but if there is a link to her family and children, then there is hope for her return. But what if things are worse? Not only has Helen descended through realities, but also she is unwell. There are no family or children. She really is cut adrift. She's lost in a cold and decaying hell running out into a monochrome purgatory with blind faith and two beings that aren't who she thinks they are, this concept is truly terrifying. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, 
please give it a thumbs up and let me know in the comments which is your favourite short horror story. Thanks and stay spooky.